Recorded live in Balcata, Western Australia, the hoon capital of the world, this is Talkin' Power. Gap is what happens uh, when you hold to the floor and crush the man next to you. There's space in between your back bumper and your front bumper. We, uh, in the South, we refer to it as the Gap Band. Well, I think, you know, Formula One is for grown-ups. Episode 39 of the Talk and Power podcast. I'm here with Simon Gonzo Travellini and I'm Nick DeCembri. Welcome along, Simon. Nick, what an awesome weekend. Another one. First Father's back. Day. Congratulations, by the way. A lot of firsts. Yep. First three second pass by a radial car in Australia. That was awesome. That was an it awesome. It was. Effort. Jared Wood smashing out a 399 at 196 mile an hour mm. at the final Kender event for yeah, Willowbank Raceway. Yeah. yeah. For the year. Yep. yep. Yep, so they've wound up their, their championship. What a, it was quite quite an awesome run. That that car's actually from the US. Now you were telling me today that's actually on the Before we get to that. Sorry. Okay. Before we I'm get to jumping, that while, while we're on the around. on the three second celebrations, mm. first three second pass for a two seven five car. Yeah, that was I was in the three eighty nines. I think it was in the first into the eighties. Sorry, first first into the eighties. Eighties, yeah. First in the eighties. Yeah, yep, yep. Yep, so that was the Bumblebee car of... Jeez, I'm on the hop here, aren't I? Where was he? Darlington. Yeah, Darlington. Jeff and Patrick Miller in their Bumblebee Camaro. So that went 80, 389 at 194 mile an hour. That was about two weeks ago, actually. So it the, was just after our last podcast. The radial racing here has become a lot like door slammer. Mm. Buy a car in from the US, get a tuner over. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well, that was a big ticket event, that one. And we had some, some it pretty was. big names come over for that. We did. Shane Tuckerberg yeah. was yep. in town. Um, and in traditional... HRO Willowbank fashion. Mm. The guys at Six Boost rolled out their Camaro. Shane tuning. The thing went for an epic run down the track. NTR. <laughs> Not by choice. Yeah. There was no NTR written on the windscreen yeah. or anywhere. Just the Willowbank timers <laughs> doing their usual thing. Another Chris shout Matheson. out for Chris. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Chris Matheson. We should Possib- joke. possibly the first five second top bike pass in Australia. It must be his magnetos. <laughs> <laughs> so we're urging everyone out there if you're running at Willowbank Raceway shield your magneto with some alfoil because <laughs> that's probably what's causing the problem but that's what they told us here at Perth anyway yeah look um, yeah so no it was he, Tyler Crossno was also over as well for that for the same event he was so, drag racing promoter in the US racer as well and um, tuner too he's a jack of all trades Tyler congratulations to all the team there yeah. um, yep uh I got told today by the Transbuilder. Oh, okay. Yep. They, apparently, they um, they didn't hurt an engine, but they decided to switch to their um, spare engine during the event. So, yep. they worked very hard for that three-second pass. Let me yeah. give you a tip. Yep. And also, congratulations to Lee Dark on winning the championship in the 660 Combat. So, that's the top tier of the radial... Um, of the the Kenda series, and uh, he's won the championship in his big block, uh, big block Chev Dodge Avenger. So I've also been told that it seems like the radial rules are finalised uh, for the Motorplex. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, apparently, full chassis cars will be allowed. Yep. Um, so we're just waiting to hear that officially from the track. But yep. um, according to radial races, it is set in concrete. So full chassis cars in. Apparently, yep, yep. yep. So, um, actually, looking forward to a few of the East Coast races coming over because this is kind of their off season now. Yep. So the opportunity for them to run at another track is looking good. So, uh, fingers crossed, we'll see some low four second, uh, maybe even another three second pass. I know there's yeah. a, a lot of guys. Um, uh, Perry Bullivan, mm. um, you know, he's gunning for his first three. Yep. And there's a couple of other guys there right on the cusp. So, mm-hmm. should be some good radial racing at the Motorplex this season. Yeah, yeah. No, we're looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. And the, 
the new rules as they come to hand. Unlike the MotoGP, which was a total washout. Yeah, look, I mean, it was uh, really sad. It was a double header that night, so we had the Formula One on as well over in Belgium. But the, it was really sad to see that the, the MotoGP just couldn't couldn't get it couldn't get it done couldn't get the job done. Unfortunately, it would be nice if the MotoGP guys just admitted that the reason they couldn't go to a rain day was because of their TV deals, mm. rather than. You know, some of the ridiculous excuses that I heard about the um, the tractor drivers, <laughs> council workers, council workers. That was the best one that I heard. Council workers. workers. It was a Sunday. You, you, it was a public be, holiday. It would be tough to get council workers on a. <laughs> or do you respect to, to, get, get, to or the local shires did, in Perth? Did you say it's tough to get council workers <laughs> on a Sunday? But anyway, that was one of the reasons that that I heard. But. Look, it was it was really sad, and it, it's a real pity that they couldn't get the job done on the Monday. I, I really, there, there were. It was a public holiday. Yeah, yeah, that was the frustrating part. And I'm mm. sure that anyone that was there, working or otherwise, would certainly have wanted to be there the Definitely. next day to see a race. Yeah. You know. Yep. yep. So um, it's kind of locked the championship in for Marquez now. I feel. I, yeah, I think so too. I think so as well. The the disappointing thing was as well the drainage. The track Silverstone's had some resurfacing done not that long ago, and it looks like the drainage isn't really up to up to spec. They're not they're not dispersing the water quick yeah, enough. Yeah, but I mean, could they start? No. No, 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 no chance. Not, not, not in the time frame that they gave themselves. I think even uh, by... Um, I think they even had another attempt at four o'clock in the afternoon and they still weren't able to get it started. I, d- I did try and follow it on the net mm. um, and I saw that they'd rolled the bikes or begun to roll the bikes onto the grid, yep. but, you know, it wasn't going to happen. And, and unfortunately, the 10 network... I mean, they, they stayed with it as long as they could, but then they felt the need to put the V8s <laughs> I on. I know, so. they put the V8s on. Yeah, yeah. So. I would have preferred to watch the rain yeah. than the V8s. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Never mind, never mind. <laughs> so the same evening, we had the Formula One in Belgium. My favourite track... It's. I call it. I often call it the Bathurst of of Formula One because we you know, it's seven kilometers long. A lot of people probably wouldn't realise that. Um, we had the normal uh, first lap antics carrying on, um, but I mean when it was all said and done, Vettel got around Hamilton before the main like on the main straight before the safety car came out. Daniel Ricciardo unfortunately had some damage. Uh, he had a collision with uh, Kimi Raikkonen, so that that really put both of them on the back foot. Unfortunately, uh, Sebastian Vettel really quite a boring race to be frank. Uh, was never really headed after the first lap and got out there and got the job done and and won quite convincingly. Interestingly enough, after that race, Lewis Hamilton felt that they were down on power and down on straight line straight line speed, and they had concerns going into Monza this weekend. Um, it, it it is a track that suits the higher power cars. Yeah, so. definitely. Yeah, so yeah. so Ferrari have obviously up the ante. We saw them do a front uh, front grid lockout at Monza as well. Too much to the um, to the Italian fans' excitement. Uh, um, unfortunately, there was an incident in Monza between um, young Lewis Hamilton and Vettel. To be frank, I think. It was a racing incident, in my view. Um, a lot of people disagree. Um, if anything, it was probably more uh, Vettel's fault. Just into the first chicane, had a massive bit of understeer. The car went sort of straight on and tagged Hamilton. Unfortunately, Vettel spun out as a result. Um, and yeah, that was the end of the race, really, for him. Unfortunately, they pitted the car straight away because the safety car came out. I think they... They went for a soft again. If they had, if they had the ability to get home on those tyres, they were definitely in with a chance. Unfortunately, the Ferraris were chewing up tyres yep. worse than the Mercedes. So uh, even Raikkonen had to pit twice as well. So that really put their chances, uh, really put put an end to their chances of winning the race. Um, we had an interesting incident in qualifying between Alonso and Magnussen. I love Kevin Kevin Magnussen. I I think he's he typifies. 
the spirit of Formula One or where it needs to be. He says it as it is, and he, he called out Alonso. And I felt that Alonso probably didn't handle that situation all that well. Um, and then the you know the, the Husses, Gunther Steiner, and, and McLaren, Zach Brown, got embroiled in it as well. So they had an incident in qualifying, which basically prevented Magnussen from continuing on into Q3. Those Haas cars have got a lot of speed now, and they should have really been up there in sixth or fifth. But anyway, he was locked out, and um, I mean, he called it for for what it was. So it was good to see the the fighting spirit. And Alonso, look, I, I think he felt that he had the right to to be there. But um, at the end of the day, I think if Magnussen was in front by the parabolic car, I think he has the right to to lead on that. It, it was qualifying, you know. Yep. Surely the boys can sort it out. It was also good to see Ferrari um, break the uh, lap record. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and um, uh, Raikkonen at 38. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he becomes the oldest oldest um, pole sitter since Nigel Mansell, 1994. Yeah. I can't believe it. Yeah. So, yeah, no, it was really good to see Raikkonen. And the Ferraris were geared up. There was no doubt about it. They, they were in a position to win this race. It was just that incident with with Lewis Hamilton. And as I said, a lot of people called me the Lewis Hamilton hater. Look, I'll call it as it is. It wasn't his fault. Uh, I felt, if anything, it was Vettel's fault. So be it. Interesting Max Verstappen at the end of the race got docked uh, five seconds as well uh, for his move on Bottas as well. Uh, that was interesting and had a bit of a rant about that in on the radio. Look, I kind of understand where Verstappen was coming from. If he had seen are you, the replay... Are you going to play that or are you going to no, read no, it? No, no, I'll just read it out. He goes, <laughs> so they call out, they said, you, you've got a five-second penalty and he yells out for what? He goes, they're doing a great job of killing racing. No, um, I think he's right. Yeah. Um, they're Americanizing it. Yeah. <laughs> Look, and, and but the thing is, they're not really Americanizing it. See, if they were Americanizing it, Bottas would have run out onto the track with his helmet and thrown it at Raikkonen. <laughs> you know, they're kind of trying to make it like, um, what's the car show, the really exclusive car show that they have in America um, uh, where, where mere millionaires have the opportunity to compete against billionaires no, pebble beach oh pebble beach right they're yeah. trying to you know oh like this no we're not rednecks we're like pebble beach look we oh. have have billion dollar cars <laughs> you know we have a million dollar car that we spent a billion restoring monterey car week that was on actually just on the weekend monterey <laughs> there you go yeah i'm surprised they're not going to have a formula one race in the car park of Monterey. <laughs> anyway, getting back to the Bottas incident, he goes, and, and it, it, what he should have done was yield to Bottas after that because Bottas was still right behind him. But he, he, he came on the radio and said, look, I know I'm losing time to Vettel, but I really don't care. And in the end, that cost him a spot to Vettel as well because if he'd let Bottas go through, he could have kept that five-second gap between him and uh, Vettel, but did chose not to. And uh, Vettel ended up finishing... Um, fourth in that race so we had lewis hamilton win great win for the mercedes and look you know what they really stitched it up to the italians and it and it really hurts me to say that but this was payback for silverstone at silverstone uh vettel at the end of the race said in the italian we've got the flag the british flag we're going to take it back to marinello we won in their backyard so the um someone from a yeah, uh, someone, it's... someone from mercedes got on the radio and said um Form up, get into formation, and just show the colleagues in Italy what we're all about, or words to that effect. So, look, I think it was a <laughs> well, good... Well, this is up. a bit of a Mussolini-Hitler-Churchill episode here playing out, you know? <laughs> Except for some reason, Italy ended up on no one's team. <laughs> so, it was, look, it was really good to see them uh, fight back. And I think, you know, it, uh, Hamilton goes in with a 30-point uh, lead now into, into the... You know, only seven races to go. It's going to be tough from here on in. He can drop a whole race and still be leading the championship. Now, seeing as we're, we're talking about Lewis Hamilton, we should talk about some bondage here. So, Formula One's, Formula One's got some teams. slave teams. Yeah, look, it's <laughs> What's been, that about, Nick? Does it involve whips and... <laughs> Not quite, but look, it's been Gim interesting. Marks, <laughs> Over the years, we've had teams... And I'm personally, I'm not opposed to it myself, but we've had teams that... Let's just say, for the lack of a better word, perform R and D for the leading team. So, in many ways, Hass are performing R and D for the Ferrari cars. They run a Ferrari setup. 
the the perception is now that Force India, under their new owners, Lawrence Stroll, he'll be doing uh, a lot of R&D in the Mercedes with Mercedes. So a lot of the lesser teams, Williams want to put an end to it and they want to kind of stop that. But I don't I don't think that's in the spirit of the sport. I, I don't know. I, I personally don't have a, a view against it. Um, it would be I, interesting I think, to look, know what our listeners think. It's just really strange that in a sport that the average team blows a half a billion dollars a year Mm. they're talking about you know restricting the amount of money they spend yeah to what yeah 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 499 million well what did you think currency what what did you like in this particular race in monza for whatever reason and whether it was right or wrong but ricardo took a new engine um he had to but he took an engine that hasn't been tested renault haven't even used this c-spec engine so the own Renault team, they even told Red Bull, this is a new engine. We haven't got it in our cars yet, but they went and put it in dance. Now, I don't know if it was in Verstappen's car either. I don't know that. I can't confirm. But Daniel definitely had a new C-spec engine and failed to finish the race. Now, they're saying it was a clutch issue, but I don't know. We'll find out in Singapore if he's starting from the back of the grid again. Look, you would think that the calibre that an engine manufacturer needs to be to compete in Formula 1 that they would test those engines on a dyno and race simulate everything. Mm. You know what I mean? So I, I don't... you got to eventually run it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what are you going to do? Put it in qualifying? You're still going to wear the same penalties. But wh- why would you go in with the manufacturer's engine that hasn't even been run yet? In that they're not running in their own car. They could have gone back to the B spec. Yeah, but they might not be running it because of other reasons, mm. because of, uh, you know, good penalties or... Yeah. Whatever. Uh, well, no, Hulkenberg had to have a new engine as well in the Renault. Oh, yeah, and he but went with But they still the... went with a B-spec, so or spec B. So I'm using the wrong terminology. Spec B, not B-spec. You would have to ask Red Bull, Nick. Yeah, anyway, Christian <laughs> Horner. We'll get him on the podcast one day. <laughs> anyway, so that's um, that was in regards to um, the Formula 1. So that was that was an interesting interesting couple of weeks we've had in Formula 1. U.S. Nationals. Let's get on to the U.S. Nationals. Oh, yes. that The cream on of... That's it. The cream of the weekend. Yeah, it really well, it wasn't actually We the, probably should have kind opened. Kind of technically was the weekend, but <laughs> I don't was, know. It was Monday there. The U.S. It was probably <laughs> still Sunday here anyway. No, no, it was Tuesday here. It was Tuesday. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah it was too. Yeah. yeah. So, big news. Yeah. Stevie Fast Jackson. Our man, Stevie Fast. He is the U.S. Nationals Pro Mod Champion. Had to happen. Took home the, took home the biscuits. Now it wasn't a, a inspiring final. He ran a six, six point one six seven. Hey uh, mate, whoever uh, crosses the stripe first. Well, he was racing Jose Gonzalez. Now he is no slouch, Jose. No, he's no slouch at all. But listen to who he beat to get there. These are some some pretty big names. He in the first round he had Sydney Frino. Yeah. Second round Bob Raham. Listen to this for the semi final. Mike Castellano, who Jeez. was the top qualifier, yeah, by yeah. the way. Yep. And then, uh, as I said, uh, in the final, he had um, uh, Jose Gonzalez. Yep. So it, it was no walk he in the park it. for him. He yeah. Any hole shots? I don't know. I haven't got the times here. I've only got the final, so I can't tell you. He's been working hard, Stevie. Yep. It's about time he got a win. Yeah, and that's the, the one you want to win, isn't it? So. The, um, yeah, the, the the U.S. Nationals, mm. Gator Nationals, yep. and the Winter Nationals, yeah. probably the three, yeah, they're the three th- biggest. They're the three, yep, yep, no doubt. Um, probably four wide as well would be up yeah. there now, I'd yep. say. Yep. So they have completed eight of 12 rounds. Stevie is sitting in fifth spot now after that win. So Four rounds to go. Yeah, you never know. You never know. They are off to Gateway Motorsport Parks on the 23rd of September. So we look forward to seeing how he goes there. All right. The V8 supercars. <laughs> the old ZB <laughs> goes to dominance again. It did. Yeah, look, I mean, Triple Eight have really, in the supercars, Triple uh, Eight have really turned it around this season. In the, in the last five races now, they've really turned the, turned it right around. And they're actually leading the championship now. It's amazing how quick they developed that car. Yeah. Yeah, they've gone from... Not competitive at Barbagallo to extremely competitive by Talem's Bend. Mm. So it's it was good to see. Uh, we had Van Gisbergen win on the Saturday and we had Wing Cup win on the Sunday um, at a new track. 
Yes. So the the going well over there. It was not a bad track from the look of things. It looked all right. Um, I don't know how the facilities outside the track are, but uh, looked looked to be quite good. Hey, I was interested. RM Sotheby's had an auction uh, about a week oh, or two yes, ago. Oh yes, they did. And um, Nick, that car. The 1964 Ferrari 250 yep. GDO mm. is by far my favourite car ever made. It's a beautiful car. They were actually expecting 65 million US for it. Well, the last one that got sold prior to this mm. went for over 30 million yeah. pound. Yeah. Yep. So, um, you know, one of uh, one of the great stockbrokers in the US was asked once if he could have invested in anything. Mm-hmm. any stock, any share, anything, what would it have been? And he said, I would have bought a Ferrari 250 GDO because yep. back in 64, they were $6,500. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I believe one of the drummers, either a drummer or a guitarist from Pink Floyd, I don't know his name, He's actually he has one, and I think he paid 120000 for his, but many years Unbelievable. ago. Unbelievable. And that was big money back then. Like People thought he was nuts. Unbelievable. Yeah, look what he's sitting on right now. And apparently his one is a very, very, very good example. Also, third place winner from Le Mans 1966, a Ford GT Mark II. That was nine, almost $10 million Mm. in US, US, this is US currency. Yeah, those cars, uh, you know, first, second and third in that race, they will always be, you know, the pinnacle of of motorsport um uh what's the word i'm looking for here not history uh like the you know do you you know the background story about yeah 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 you know course, yeah. ford ford spent in today's money billions mm. of dollars on the whole gd40 program uh built a supercomputer to yep. design the gd40 on um, because he wanted to beat Ferrari because the deal fell through on the sale mm. of Ferrari to Ford. Yep. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it was pretty significant when they came first, second and third. Yeah. It, was, yeah. um, it would have been an incredible moment for uh, Henry Ford Jr. Mm. If you're interested in that sort of thing, and our listeners, if, if you are interested in that sort of thing, there's a documentary. I haven't watched it myself. I've got to download it. You can get it from www.chassis.com, S. H A S S Y. It's called the Twenty Four Hour War, and it's a documentary about these cars. Yeah, about the nineteen sixty six yeah. race in particular. Well, from what I can understand, uh, they given the project to the English mm. to um, you know manage whatever, and they built a smaller engined version, like a two eighty nine or whatever it was, yeah. motored uh, with the aerodynamics a bit better mm. but uh, the thing had a tendency of lifting the front yep so then they gave it to carol shelby mm-hmm. <laughs> who sorted it out he got rid of a little five liter yeah dropped the 427 in there yeah and um you know put some spoilers and stuff on it to keep the thing stuck to the track yeah and yep. uh, and i think then the next issue was the um the transmission mm. they used to run a, a car craft uh transmission yep and I think they had a few issues, the old 427 sort of yeah. winding everything up. <laughs> yeah. But they did it. They got there in the end. They certainly did, yeah. Um, yep. Surprisingly enough, the uh, so the Mark Mark, Mark 1 was the one that had the aerodynamic issues. The Mark 2 was, you know, the race winner. Then they brought out the Mark 3 because they had to homologate them for the road. So mm-hmm. they had this road-going version, slightly longer front, yep. uh, slightly longer tail with a boot. And uh, the headlights placed to meet certain safety requirements for, for road going vehicles. Uh, 302 mm. winds are in them. And I think they used a Hewland uh, or a ZF transmission because mm. uh, the race one was more like a dog yeah. uh, type transmission. Um, then they released the Mark IV. Yeah. So the Mark IV looked, um, it was a, a bit wider car, yeah. more like a Porsche uh, 917. That kind of one, you know, nine thirty dash seven, and that year that they released the Mark IV, the Mark IIs beat the Mark IV. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. No, I did know that, and it was a interesting time. As I said, if you're interested in that sort of thing, get on and, and download that. That I think I don't know how much it costs. You got to pay for it, but it's um, 
Well, worth watching. I've got to, I've got to get on and watch that myself, actually. If, so it looks, I've seen the highlights. It looks excellent. If you're interested in these types of cars, the, um, the car that really, to me, personified that era was the Porsche 917, mm. uh, 917-30, I think it was. Um, it was a flat 12 air-cooled, mechanically injected um, turbocharged, I think twin turbocharged. Now, these cars are pretty light. I think they weigh around 800 kilos from mm-hmm. memory. And I'm pretty sure that that motor wound up makes about 1,500 horsepower. <laughs> Yeah, right. so, okay. Is that the so, one that has the two spark plugs per cylinder as well? Probably, probably does. I know that it's got a great big knob on the dash that you, you turn and there's a cable that goes to the wastegate yeah, and okay. it, it changes the tension on the spring. <laughs> <laughs> so you just keep winding it in the era, the pre-electronic era, the analog era. <laughs> um, you know, that that's... Uh, Le Mans GT racing and Can Am in particular, yeah. um, some real animal cars yeah. came out of that era in, during the sixties and the seventies. So, um, you know, if you're into that thing, you should check it out because the amount of people that have never even heard of them mm. um, are just shocked. I think they were like a five point four liter, five liter, five, five liter. Five. I'm I'm only talking because I've got the internet open in front of me so yeah I, you're right yeah, flat 12 amazing yeah, amazing car to look I, at isn't I, I, it? Beautiful I think car. i think they may have punched them out to 5.4 a little bit later on in their career okay yep yep but yeah i think believe 1500 horsepower or more actually was seen by a dyno operator once yeah okay 1558 i think was the number can you imagine that 800 kilos <laughs> with 1500 make a good road car <laughs> 800 kilos you're right spot on 800 kilos their their curb weight was great grocery getter oh yeah (laughs) looks it (laughs) if you haven't seen what simon's talking about just just google 917 amazing car to look at (laughs) 917-30 yeah yeah Anyway, <laughs> isn't it amazing? That was in 19, what, 69? 69. It ran from 69 to 70, and then the K version ran from 70 to 71. It was only 25 in... And from 5.4 litres mm. of air-cooled engine... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ...they managed to make 1,500 horsepower. <laughs> There's no... They're, they're not... They don't say a hell of a lot about it here, but one was sold at auction in last year... For fourteen million dollars. Yeah, I, th- I believe the best examples are still at the Porsche yeah. um, factory, and I believe that they still fire it up every once in a while for like Goodwood and. Yeah, that's what. It, yeah, it raced at Goodwood last yeah. year as well. Yep. But you know, it just like it's it still amazes me. Turbo technology back in nineteen sixty nine would have been pretty primitive. Yeah. Like I said, there was a cable going to the gate. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, they still manage to squeeze that much power out of a 5.4 litre. Yeah. If you did that now, that would be impressive. Mm. Yeah, it certainly would be. You know? yeah. and, and like I know, um, the uh, Hot Rod did a, a series where they took stock LSs, the um, truck iron block LSs, and put camshafts, heads, and boosted them to see when they'd break. Mm. And they their six litre, I think, was the biggest one that they did, and they managed to get 1,500 out yeah. of that before it broke. But bear in mind, that thing there had to go for 24 hours. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> Not 24 seconds. <laughs> so pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Just to quantify that as well, zero to 100 kilometres an hour, zero to 60, 2.3 seconds. Yeah, no traction control back in those days. Zero to 200 kilometers an hour or 124 mile an hour, 5.3 seconds. <laughs> so in a, on an 11 second pass, right, down the quarter, mm. you get to 200. Yeah. <laughs> so this the top speed was 240 mile an hour, 390 kilometers an hour. So just under 400 kilometers an hour. So that is impressive. It's a stout car. 1969. <laughs> now, this is the car also. I did know a little bit about this car. This was used, this car 
was featured in the 1971 movie uh, Le Mans. Le Mans, yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. Steve McQueen. Oh, speaking of Le Mans. Yes. Le Mans. One of our sponsors. Shuey Bond. Shuey Bond. He's off next From next WA Suspensions. WA Suspensions. Yeah. Yep. yep. So they're off next weekend down to the Collie Motorsport Park and they will be racing the Mitsubishi Lancer. In the... 24 hours of Le Mans. Now, now what I lemons. What I really, what I really want to know hmm. is why didn't we have a car in that? I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, Nick, you're supposed to be on top of this stuff. Thank you. That would be an event perfect for us. I know, I know, it would have been perfect for us. But anyway, we wish Stewie and the team at WA Suspensions all the best down there with their car. And and on that note, I think hmm. that. Um, Stewie's name is missing from this Hall of Fame nomination. So I, yes. think that, I think that uh, we or, or someone should uh, should be nominating him. Well, they, these are the current... I just put them in there, the current Hall of Fame members at the moment. So it's George Bailey. Well, well-deserved one uh, yep. there, George Bailey. Michael Athelwood. Yep. Paul Rogers Sr. Graham Cowan. Graham Cowan, another yep. one, yeah. Dennis Siramis. Jim G- Reed. Joe Gatt. Joe Gatt, yep. John, John Taverna. Taverna. Jim Reed. Again. Oh, different reads. Mm. Ah, yeah. of course. <laughs> and Harry White. And Harry White, yes. Yeah, yeah. so they're the current hall. So nominations are now open. So get on the Andrew website. There is a form there you can fill out and submit your nominations for this year's Hall of Fame. Also, a bit of other Andrew news as well. There is a Andrew WA Division Tech Inspection. It will be the same day as uh, Custom Cars and Coffee down at the track, Motorplex that is, Perth Motorplex, on Sunday the 16th of September. So get down there between 9 and 12.30 p.m. or go to the website and um, or email, go to the, um, yeah, the, or the Andrew oh, website. Oh, you need to book in advance? They would prefer you to, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yep, so that's a bit of Andrew news at the moment. Next Andrew event is the 22nd and 23rd of September, which is actually next, not next weekend, the weekend after. Mildura, the Sunset Strip. It will be the Sunset Nationals, so looking forward to that. And the nostalgia is coming up. Yeah, 30th of September. End of this month. Yeah, yeah. Yep. so we'll, I'll, sorry, I'll be down there. We've uh, So come and say hello and uh, grab a sticker or two. Oh, we've got stickers. We've got stickers, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, no, we've got stickers all over it. There you go. Yep. <laughs> Do want one for these? No, things. can you organise some for all fast? Yes, no problem. <laughs> no problem. Are they good stickers? Are they okay? Yeah, they're right. They're right there. There you go. You're gonna start giving talks at school, hand them out. There you go. Geez, they're big stickers. Well, they're gonna go in the bags, the giveaway bags. Oh, we we've, we've got uh, we've got show bags. We're gonna stand at the raw okay. show. <laughs> I'm work- I've got to get the bags still, but they're for the bags. And then there's... Jeez, they are massive stickers, Nick. This is this is really legitimate podcast stuff. This is the crinkling of a plastic bag in the background. My apologies. And these are our window stickers here. If you're watching the video... Big stickers. <laughs> so what did you get for Father's Day? Did you get a sticker? I got a couple of t-shirts and a magazine. The last, I think it was the last Forged magazine. Oh, yeah, excellent. Mm. There you go. Is I it? got a, uh, yeah, yeah. What did you get? I got a, um, my first Father's Day. Mm. Pretty happy. I saw that <laughs> photo of you and young Nicholas. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Oh, that's awesome. Been busy. Cute. Um, I got a Hugh Hefner style robe. Oh, that's yeah. all right. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm thinking that maybe Christmas I'll get a pipe to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I got some jocks. Oh, okay, <laughs> I think I right. think it's important that jocks are given on Father's Day. Yeah, it's an essential. Uh, I agree. <laughs> jocks and so, socks. So, mate. so, mate, there's all these tours happening at the moment. I don't know if you're aware of this. All these nationalists that are coming to Australia to talk to us about um, why why we need to change our immigration policy and sever our ties with China. Mm. And I was listening to one on the way here tonight who was involved in the Trump campaign. He was also involved in Brexit. Yep. English uh, guy, Nigel, I forget his second name. Anyway, uh, he's currently in Australia. And, um, you know, he's continuously getting bombarded with, um, you know, you're a racist, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Um, And earlier this morning, I was at a workshop um, and there happened to be a few guys just show up all at the same time. And we got into a bit of a discussion and uh, what Nigel was talking about on the radio on the way here about if the, the Liberals don't, um, 
you know, go back to their core uh, conservative values, then there's probably going to be a breakdown of the Liberal Party. And we've just seen hmm. the big breakdown, you know, unravelling yeah. of Turnbull and uh, now the the uh, appear. Uh, yeah. saga yeah. of, of yeah. Peter, um, Dutton. Peter Dutton, you know, and, and ScoMo. Mm. It seems unusual calling our Prime Minister ScoMo, but <laughs> is he releasing an album soon? <laughs> Don't know. Anyway, um, one, one of the guys, uh, you know, said something really tangible. With everyone feeling so frustrated with the current political climate, it, 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 it's worth noting that the Liberal Party didn't start that long ago. It was um, uh, Robert Menzies, mm. Sir Robert Menzies, I believe, um, that started it. And I think it was only like 40-odd, 50-odd years ago. Mm. So maybe the time is right for a new political party, something that is more akin to what I like to refer to as a silent majority. Because, yeah. you know, when you get people alone and talk to them, most people feel the same way about what's going on in Australia at the moment, that it seems like, you know, those of us that do have jobs and pay taxes and are legitimate seem to be carrying the whole country. I mean, mm. our income tax, from, from those of us that actually do work, um, covers 45% of the revenue for all the government. Yep. So that's at a, a council level at a state level and at a federal level. And it seems strange that we should be doing all the heavy lifting when there's companies out there that are making billions of dollars. Mm. I mean, surely if they paid just a little bit of tax, then they would be paying more than what, you yeah. know, just your average Joe Blow worker's paying. But unfortunately, it's not like that. So maybe it is time and maybe through our listener network Australia-wide, maybe we need to start talking about this mm. a new political party now if you were gonna start a new political party yep right i don't think the name really matters mm. it's the color yeah okay right so we've already got we've already got red yep. and blue yep we've got yellow yep we've got green mm -hmm. right so so we, you know this is what i want everyone to think about because the color is important it's it's arguably more important than the name <laughs> what color right let's rule out purple straight up <laughs> Why is that? Because you know, it's just <laughs> we're already frustrated. That's why yeah, we're doing it. We don't. We don't. Maybe that's it. Maybe it should be purple. Yeah, I know. It'd be more indicative. We're all pissed of, off with the current more politics. More indicative of where, where we're sitting at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so I want everyone to think about that. Think about what colour the new political party. Yeah. In case you didn't know, yellow's uh, Pauline Hanson. Mm. The one thing that anyone should have taken out of what. Uh, Nigel was talking about on the radio tonight was the fact that and and he was very open about saying this that politics worldwide is controlled by big business mm. it's, and and a democracy by definition means that no matter what the decision is if the majority of people want it that's what we do mm. okay so what's happened now is that the idiots, and I'm going to call them what they are, the idiots uh, have turned the discussion into this, that if we talk about immigration, if we discuss it, we're being racist. Mm. So we can't even discuss it. Yep. Well, to all the idiots out there, the reality is that in a democracy, no matter whether it's right or wrong in your eyes, if the majority of people want to have that discussion then we have it that is how a democracy works yeah so it's like brexit it's like trump you know they're in it happened yeah. right get over it mm. move on so just because you and your little peanut brain think that the, the world is going to be a better place you know being part of the the, the european union or not having trump the reality is, especially in the Trump case, if you look at um, how fast their economy is growing, I mean, y you know, anyone that would argue for Obama or anyone prior to that is clearly got some mental issues because 
uh, you know, he's he's getting it done. Mm, there's yeah, more course. work. There's more job. The the uh, wages are increasing. The economy's moving. Look at the dollar. Mm. You know, the dollar. Our dollar is sliding because their dollar is strengthening. Mm. So you know, it's this, it's the big problem. The big problem that we've got worldwide yep. is that we don't have uh, a, a true democracy. We've got a silent majority. Mm. We get silence because we get told, and that. Uh, uh, Fraser Anning's speech, you know, they, they tore him to shreds, but he just said what most people are thinking. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I've noticed is through all these debates that we've had, like the Yes campaign and so on, anyone that goes against the left gets bashed, you know? And then and then they're telling us how we're, we're the ones that are causing the trouble. You know, why, don't, why can't we just have a discussion? Mm. You know, that's what democracy is about. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's things that we need to talk about. Like, I, I gave the example today, and I think for anyone that has gone and done a trade or... And I haven't, right? My, my entire life has just been... I got thrown in the deep end and had to figure it out. But I've worked with plenty of people. I've had apprentices work under me. And I understand what's involved. And I've been to school. I've been to university, right? For anyone that's been to uni and have finished a degree or, or uh, been a TAFE and, and finished a diploma or gotten a trade, right, there is not enough disparity between the minimum wage and what you get as a tradesman, mm. okay? And, and what I mean by that is the minimum wage is $750 a week now, yeah. okay? There are tradesmen out there that get 1000 bucks a week. Now, there is no way in the world that you can justify to me the, the difference between someone that's gone through and gotten that piece of paper, right, should only be $250. Mm. People are going to argue, yeah, but there's guys out there that don't have that piece of paper that are better than tradesmen. I'm not going to argue with that, right? But, but those people surely would be known in the industry would be able to show their capabilities. The problem here is the minimum wage, mm. right? That is the problem because you don't have the incentive to hire someone if you have to pay them so much, I'd yeah. rather get a tradesman. Yeah. I'd rather get someone that's got a ticket that you know you would expect knows what they're doing mm. than someone that doesn't. You know what I mean? And I'm not going to train someone that doesn't if I've got to pay them nearly the same amount. Yeah. And think about the guy on the shop floor that's the tradesman that's gone through all that training, et cetera, et cetera, got all that experience. If he finds out that he's only getting a couple of hundred bucks more than the guy that doesn't even know how to sweep the floor properly. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And I don't think it's a union thing. Like the Liberals like to throw it on the on Labor and say, oh, yeah, it's the bloody unions, the bloody unions. Not when you have companies like, you know, we have a set of regulations that we're supposed to be following. What, what we need to do is we need, need to sit down and, and think about this logically, right? Yeah. If you're going to let stuff come in from China, right, and their minimum wage is five bucks an hour, if they even have... A minimum wage, then how can you let that happen and expect us to pay seven hundred fifty bucks a week? You mm. can't. Yeah, that's so right. you either got to tariff them, right, or you got to deregulate our uh, wages. Yeah. One or the other. You can't. You can't have this hypocritical attitude that our government's got. And when they talk about these free trade agreements, a load of bullshit. Because it's not. You know. Oh, Nick, I want to. I want to sell you know, our podcast to China. No, 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 it doesn't work like that. What these laws do is protect companies that have got trademarks and have got uh, patents. It doesn't actually mean free trade. So I think I, I think it seems to be a global movement now and it, and it seems to be gaining some momentum and they can trash out Brexit, they can trash out Trump, but, you know, things seem to be looking better you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. The the Poms have got to just you know, get on with it. Mm. They need to sort of sever the ties and show the rest of the world, hey, it, it didn't make any difference. Or yeah. things are better now. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, once again, they turned it into a racist deal, but mm. it, it's not. It's you know, and and the thing you know, the thing that came out of that a bit of a discussion this morning was what makes a country is its people, mm. right? So if you start washing or watering that down, what do you got left? Our weather, climate mm. change has ruined that. So you can't, you can't say, oh, no, the weather's there. It's great. No, it's not. No, 
we've, yeah. we've, we've ruined that. It's climate change, right? You can't, you know, the same people that are arguing about climate change are the same ones that are, are saying that we can't have a nationalist view. Why can't we have a nationalist view? Why can't we have a set of beliefs that, uh, you know, mm. sort of centred around our country? I mean, you think of, of uh, Paris, France, you think of love, romance, you know. You think of uh, uh, Italy, you think of Italian food. Mm. Well, if you went there and the only thing you could buy was Indian cuisine, you'd be pretty pissed off, wouldn't you? <laughs> you know what I mean? You went yeah. to France and... Um, I don't know. <laughs> that's, 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 I don't <laughs> There's no know. romance. <laughs> I just, I just think that um, this has all happened, and and he brought it up. That Nigel guy brought it up. He said, you know, uh, after World War Two, and and leading up into the sixties and seventies, England's uh, immigration policy allowed thirty thousand people a year into the country. Mm. Now it's at three hundred thousand. Yeah, we're in the same boat. Mm. Ours was like 15,000 and now it's like 150,000. And if you look around and, and in the morning you're driving to work, listening to our podcast, of course, and whinging about how there's too much traffic or, you know, you, you're finding it hard to find a school to put your kid in or you have to wait, you know, half a day to see a doctor. Well, that's because we've got the increase in population without the increase in infrastructure. Yeah, that's you right. Know? So yeah. there's a, there's a, uh, we talk about economic terms, we talk about the gross domestic product of a nation, which means our, our output. So everything yeah. we produce as a nation, right? What they don't talk about is, because that's called GDP, you would have heard them talking mm. about it, GDP per capita. So if your GDP doesn't go up percentage-wise as much as your your um, population does, then what happens is you actually have a, a reduction in the standard of living. Yeah. And that's what most Western countries have been through in the last 10 years mm. because we've opened the doors up. We've yeah. let the immigration get out of control. So, you know, it's, yeah, I feel that there is a, a change afoot. So last but not least... Mm. It's it's just been an, an incredible uh, couple of weeks in terms of first. Yeah. So we've seen the first first three second radial pass in mm-hmm. Australia. Yep. First three eighty pass on a two seven five. Mm-hmm. Yep. My first Father's Day, mm-hmm. and the first five second V twin top bike pass. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. So that was done by Visa Lipunen of Finland. He has gone five point nine. Sorry. Yeah. Five point nine two. At 217 mile an hour. That's crazy, yeah. man. <clears throat> so, yeah, he becomes the... This was in the European Drag Racing Series. And wh- where was that run? That was run at... Forgive my pronunciation. It was run in Sweden, but it was uh, run at Twip Arena in Sweden. It, it, is this the one that um, was in the last issue of Drag News? Uh, it could well be, and this was this only happened on the twenty sixth of August. So yeah, they run week. like two events a year or something yeah. at at this track. Yeah, incredible track, yeah. privately owned too. I think so. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah, it's the first first ever five second pass. If you remember, I mean, there's the Swedes are, are quite are, are very good at drag racing. I mean, they were the first to run in, in the low. What is it? Five. 40s in that door slammer that was in Sweden. Uh, no, that was at Santa Pod, but they were a, a, a Swedish a, a team. Swedish team as yep. well. So yeah, they're, they're um they love the drag racing over there. And and uh, at one stage they held the motorcycle record. Mm. And they went to America to race Spider Man McBride. Yep. <clears throat> I don't know if this one was backed up. However, I don't know if this is actually being backed up. Is the first they're saying their first official run, but I don't know if it's a record because I don't believe it's been backed up. Unbelievable! I'll tell you mm. what, there'd be a few Yanks pissed off about that. Mm. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Well done, Visa. <laughs> All right. Well, look on that note, we'll, we'll call this podcast done and dusted. So, um, just in closing, yet yeah, uh, if you're down at the Motorplex for the um, nostalgias, come over and say hello. Also, if you're going down to the Motorplex, make sure you try and get down there for custom cars and coffee. That will be on the uh, 16th of September. So that's a Sunday from 9 a.m. to 12.30. There's also a 
tech inspection day as well for Andra. And that tech inspection is free, by the way. And also, for those of you that uh, live in WA Mm -hmm. um, and those that are travelling, if you have ever wanted to feel the thrill of drag racing to Mm. get an idea of of what it's actually like to... um, to launch at uh, you know two or three G's, um, you know I strongly suggest that you um, check out Kyle Putland's yeah. uh, three seater dragster and uh, book yourself in. I believe he's locked in a few dates now. He has yeah. So, there's three dates through the through the through the season. Um, you can go to his Facebook page and it's called the Quarter Mile Drag Racing Experience. Yeah, I, I can tell you now that there is no ride on the planet. Um, that can describe what it feels like to go hurtling down a quarter mile in mm. something like that. Yep. Um, it, it feels, for, for a newbie, a 12-second car feels fast. So you're going to shit your pants in that. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Um, you know, if you uh, uh, you got to buy a gift for your partner, um, yeah. definitely, yeah. I, I think, worth... Uh, probably one of the the, the uh, most fun things that you'll ever get to do. And uh, the thing is, you need to remember that in the whole world, um, you know, you're into the the um, you know for the how many billion people are in the world, you're into probably the the uh, thousands of people that would have actually ever mm. done a run like that down the quarter mile. Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah, you know, very limited experience, very limited experience. So if you're lucky enough to um, to be able to do it, I highly recommend it. And um, I'm sure at some stage or another, I'm going to get Nick in there. <laughs> I can't wait. No, I, I do want to do it. I do want to do it. So, yeah, now if you can't find it, just go to our Facebook page, the Talking Power Facebook page. There's a link there, so you can't you can't miss it. Go to our website. You can find it from there as well. So it, if you want to have a listen to, to Kyle, go back to episode uh, 37 at the Celebration of Motorsport. Um, listen to that podcast there. You can hear Kyle talk all about his... He's got two of them. Two of those cars, not just the one. He's got two. So there you go. All right, you on that note. You don't want to have one break down. No, no, I guess not. I guess <laughs> you not. want to have a backup ready to go. <laughs> okay, on that note, uh, we'll call this podcast done and dusted. All right, Simon, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having us, Nick. No worries. All right, take care. See you on the street. See ya. Talking power, stresses, all characters and events on this podcast, even those based on real people, are entirely fictional. All celebrity voices are impersonated poorly. We do not encourage street racing or the use of turbochargers.